I'm, uh, I'm just a consultant. I live and work in Palermo in Italy on living labs and smart cities and things, and I happen to know all of these people. So I was going to uh, ask a few questions. Uh, the first to Hillary. This has been a very stimulating day, seeing on the one side the World Bank and on the other side all of this co-design living lab methodology, <laughs> which is represented by Jarmo Skelenin, of who is the president of ANAL, the European Network of Living Labs, which again has been mentioned sometimes, but not yet so clearly we're, we're here. Hillary, how did this how did this get started, and why, why was the World Bank in the beginning interested in uh, learning about living labs, exploring what was going on, getting in contact with some of these projects? I can Hello, everyone. So uh, maybe a small introduction in the beginning. So my name is Ilari Lindy, and I work at the World Bank Institute and the Knowledge Exchange Team. I'm a former member and still sharing my time also with the ICT group of the World Bank. And uh, coming, coming really into your question that why, why are we interested on this one? And I'm now talking also on the both hats. I, I think the, it's fundamentally a question about the, the problems that what we are facing in the world today, in different parts of the world. And these problems, they tend to be so great, so wicked, so enormous in a scale that we pr need to think a little bit differently that how do we actually approach to solve these problems? And what kind of a role technology has to play in this, play in this process? If you think about the pollution of the rivers, it's really the solution is far more than just a simple of clearing the water. The solution has to be something which really engages also with the mindset of the individual people. How do they deal about the river in their neighborhood? How do the companies treat about the environment? How do the government governs this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, processes? And the solutions, they are also cutting across different sectors. We are not only talking about environmental management here, we are also talking about issues which are related to potentially to the entrepreneurship and especially, of course, urban planning. So when looking at the, the problems which we have on a stake and the solutions which we have to find and usually deliver also the solutions in a very rapid manner, it's something that, that one individual or one organization cannot do by itself. So in order to find a solution, identify the solution, you need to diagnose jointly the problem as well and to agree with the problem. Then deliver the solution, prototype the solution fast in a rapid manner, understand better what works and what doesn't before you put essentially a lot of money on a game all this cause new type of approach, and all this also has something to do with ICT and the platforms, digital platforms, which are connecting not only the people who are living in the immediate sphere of this river, but also maybe in a completely different environment in the other, in the other countries or in the other cities. And the models, what uh, ENOL as a global platform and, and an organization which pulls together thousands of individuals and hundreds of organizations through collaborative, pr this kind of a collaborative process was appealing to us. Now, uh, I, I also want to make up front one, one reflection maybe which has been cutting across to the discussions today that uh, whether the solutions coming from the toolkit of the European cities or whether the solutions coming from the experiences which have been tested and trialed in the other part of the world, these are not, they may be <laughs> common problems, but I think one important thing what everybody needs to reflect is that the solutions are always different. They're always based on the local conditions, local understanding, local environment, legal regulatory framework which govern, governs the action of the different players. 
and, and this is something that, uh, that we, we would also like to see that we understand a little bit better how difficult this open approach, open innovation is. I, I think it's, it's far more difficult than the old closed model which we developed in a laboratory and delivered to the market. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jarmo, then I'd like to ask you, I've introduced you, so you, you can complete the job if you want. Um, uh, tell us a little more about ANAL, the 320 living labs. Are there co common methodologies or the variety of approaches? And uh, ANAL has recently signed a memorandum of understanding with the World Bank. What does that foresee exactly? What kind of, how is this collaboration structured? Uh, Mics all over the place, but only some of them are working. So, hi, I, you've probably seen me already a couple of times, so, but uh, as a reminder for those who don't, haven't, uh, I'm Jarmo Eskelinen, uh, and I represent the European Network of Living Labs, which is, of course, not that European anymore, and we need to do something about that, not uh, especially about the names, so we'll probably be quitting being European when it comes for names, but that's not the topic of the day. Uh, we are a uh, seven year, almost actually eight years old network. Uh, started 2006, uh, which consists of currently 345 living labs across the globe, all continents except, except Antarctic. And uh, what these labs share is that uh, they believe in the uh, hands-on open innovation methodology so that they are open innovation uh, ecosystems working in real life environments together with the users, co-creating co solutions, testing them, uh, implementing them. Um, we have uh, expanded in the seven waves during the uh, past seven years and uh, in the latest waves the internationalization has been uh, very evident so we have had new labs joining from uh, other parts of the world than Europe. And I think it's a very interesting and healthy development for, the, for which uh, I, I would like to give thanks to somewhere in the back row where Alvaro Oliveira is sitting, <laughs> who has the, uh, managed the internationalization process, because the uh, user-driven, community-driven development methods are maybe even more important in, uh, in some other circumstances than, uh, than European cities. But I think, of course, we believe that they are valid everywhere, but still. Uh, when it comes for methodologies, uh, we don't share the same methodologies or overlaps. So there are different different creatures in the network. There are ones who are uh, specialized in certain types of work, ethnographical methods, co-creation methodologies, or lead user methodologies, which are sort of maybe the key three key, key groups of uh, of activities. Uh, then there are there are ones who use some bunch of different different tools, the ones which are regionally focused, ones which are non-regional. So it's a quite diverse group of actors. Uh, nevertheless, we do believe that each of these individual unique labs, they would benefit and do benefit from knowledge exchange between what works and what doesn't. And that's what uh, we are pushing and have done collected the uh, toolbox uh, over the over the years and uh, now I think it's come to the time when that would be uh, also shared a bit more widely amongst uh, amongst the uh, innovation communities of the world and uh, that's what we are we are here for and uh, so besides uh, uh, being the moderator of the session uh, Jesse Marsh will be also the person who will uh, be the editor of the uh, toolkit development process. So what we are going to do now is to, together with the bank, uh, do a guidebook or toolkit or whatever you call it, a combination of real uh, physical printed product plus virtual uh, publishing, with which will gather together some of the bunch, bunch of the best cases, best examples, uh, which works, which doesn't, Etc. from the uh, user-driven innovation community. So this is going to be really sort of the first 
concrete project to come out of this MOU. Um, Edward, Il Ilaria, my, my apologies. I assumed that everybody in the here knew you and knew <laughs> who you are, so <laughs> I didn't think you required a presentation. And Edward, I hope to not do the same gaffe with you, but I know you are, uh, you work, al you're also with the bank, but you work more in the field. Is that correct, or am I wrong there as well? Uh, no, that's, that's correct. I'm working with the ICT sector unit of the World Bank. Okay, um, so I, w I wanted to ask you, uh, how, how do you see how do you see the clients or, or whatever you call the people you're working with in the different countries uh, benefiting, <coughs> benefiting from this collaboration? What, uh, what, what do you see as being the, the concrete benefits in the field? Right, well, my, my particular focus has been um, in sort of coordinating a, an effort that was jointly with WBI actually called Open Development Technology Alliance. So we were looking at these new participatory methodologies particularly for local level public services, which is very much the interface was the city type of service, um, transparency and accountability enabled by ICT. And through this, we really came to several stark conclusions. I mean, I think the first is that the way knowledge is created and disseminated in the 21st century, and particularly in tech-related fields, has, has really changed fundamentally towards a, a networked collaborative model. You know, the, the difference between Wikipedia and, and a traditional encyclopedia. Um, so we, we see that there is sort of the day of the lone expert in his office providing continuous advice to a, a client is, is really disappearing, especially in these, these tech-related fields that are about constant change. And so our analytical work and our policy advice to clients, I think, needs to really be shifting towards this sort of brokering of networks of expertise, really. It's, it's a, a living learning process. Um, and so that's why we've really wanted to start partnering um, with networks such as Enol for our analytical work. And, and two years ago, we, we signed an MOU with Enol, uh, June, I think, 2012. Or yeah, so one, not that long ago. And we've started participating, of course, now in these smart city projects that are all members of the Enol network. And this toolkit for us, I think, is one of our first joint analytical pieces that is a joint learning, it's not a, a north-south thing. I don't think it makes too much sense to think about developed and developing country cities anymore. It's very much thematically dependent. There are some cases that are the, the same between Dar es Salaam and Barcelona um, and others that might be quite different. So the process of bottom-up is what we're interested in, the how, and many of the lessons are, are shareable between. So we're really looking to um, share with the whole community our learnings and our case studies as well as benefit from, from those from the community through this book. So I, I'm glad Yadmo said it's a kind of hybrid between the physical product. I think we need to document what we're doing. I think we need to have tangibles that we can share. But it, it's also the process that matters and, and elements of it should be a living document. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, back to Ilori. Um, We'll have to be a little quicker in the second round, I think, if we're going to stick in our time slot. But can you tell us just briefly what's going to be in this book? How do you, how do you see it structured? Uh, well, the book itself, uh, or or the product, whatever it comes out of, yes. out of the book as well, uh, it's also a collaborative process, which is going to be going to be going to be walked through by uh, mem certain members of the Enol and Enol Council and, and a certain team. Coming, coming together on the bank side. Uh, but in, in short, uh, what we are looking there is, is that uh, we would like to really understand better that what is the process and the different step of the process behind of developing services and products and business models in a collaborative way. And how do you engage users in this process? So looking at the different parts of the process that how do you actually come together with the different stakeholders to start diagnosing the problems. Who are the problem owners? Then especially important is that uh, how do you then, uh, after identified the problems, how do you build a common agenda? What kind of a tools and instruments can be used to put the all, the all the stakeholders who have a stake in a game of cleaning the river in the same plan? Is there a road mapping tools? Are there foresighting tools? How do we make sure that these processes are inclusive as well so we have all the different stakeholders coming together who are needed at the different stage? Looking at the governance structures, how do we finance this type of activities? What are the models what the Barcelona, for example, City of Barcelona is using? How do they fit to the city service strategies? 
uh, how do we initiate and govern this kind of uh, co-creation process? Who takes the first lead? Is it going to be organizations like Forum Virium and how the Forum Viriums of the world, how do they link to the government, the municipal government? What if there isn't organization like that? Where do you start then? And also, how do we evaluate, and especially how do we consolidate, measure and consolidate the success? Do we actually achieve anything what we originally intended to achieve? So coming back to the point what Edward was saying, that it also requires set up a metrics and understanding how do we achieve the results and what are the results. And finally then, of course, network and learn. Think more about how do we learn from the peers and what are the mechanisms for such learning. And uh, looking then methodologies and technologies within this process, as well as through the lenses of practical case studies. Sounds very ambitious. Uh, Jarmo, how, how, what, how do you see the process working so that all of the value of all of the 320 living labs makes it into this process? or? or somehow that the book, this guidebook allows to tap It's a very thick it. book, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not the way, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, well, the challenge is that we are uh, working with a topic which is in a very fast, still building up, and it's a very fast, fastly moving creature. I know we're finished or ready or actually disciplined yet. And uh, that's, of course, something we need to also respect and not to claim that we have uh, sort of uh, all the answers because we don't. We are still experimenting ourselves. And uh, I think it's probably would be, it, it's an open process for starters. So we have already uh, spread the word about the opportunity to, to the both NO members. And uh, outside there's, uh, uh, some uh, uh, academic work linked linked to the linked to the book or with the open open course call for papers. Uh, not of course everything created through that process will make it to the final publication. I think uh, there will be some. Uh, we need to have a selection process, and we uh, can't yet say how that how that works. Editorial board probably. Uh, one thing which I would like to s learn better to understand through this work, because it's a learning process for us as well, is what makes the difference between those user-driven cases which are nice when they start but they end up being just you know gimmicks sort of a short-term things which don't fly and those cases which are actually adapted by the community and become part of the uh, way the city operates what in are there differences can you can you rec recognize <laughs> some point of success when the things which start as a process as a gimmick tips over and becomes a practice. Because those, of course, are the real success cases. With project money, we can create umpteen gimmicks and it's all nice and fine, but they, they stop. But uh, so which, which are the processes which make it possible for this project to keep going? And we are searching for such cases, of course. Common features of the things that work yeah. and have a real yeah. impact. Yeah. Uh, Edward, I'll, the last word to you. How? In living lab fashion, we should make sure that the end users, who are your clients, are involved, engaged somehow in co-designing this book, this tool book. Uh, how do you see do you see that happening? How can we make it a uh, the book may be the end of a process or the beginning of a process? But how can we make sure that this is really targeted to the needs of what the World Bank is doing? And and uh, and those contexts and, and and those specific situations. Um, well, I think Jesse, that the, the thing about partnership and co-creation is you don't quite know what to expect and what's going to come out. So, I can foresee a number of ways that maybe in my ICT lens we, we might engage with our clients. But I, I want to emphasize that this is really a multi-sectoral thing. So, just to put it into context, the bank in in African cities spends. $100 million a year on ICT components within the urban space. Um, and you see that uh, there's a shift now to go towards increasingly networking the cities. In East Africa, they talk about systems of cities. The last project I worked on was 14 cities in Tanzania. And these are cities of 200,000 people. I mean, they're small towns that have now grown up very quickly that are really starting from a very low level. And they all have, like the married couple, the same problems, but they all have a unique context and a unique way, and they all have to find the same way to sort of embed them and, and achieve their 
context optimization, if you like. So I think what we're really looking for is, is ways we can work with our clients to, to begin shifting from the what of our product to the how. And, and you know, the product might be many, many different flavors of, of a living lab and a smart city. But the how shouldn't be that many methodologies. We, we need to know what is working, what is sustainable. And, and we're going to be learning by doing with our clients and with our other sectors within the World Bank family. Um, so I, I hesitate to sort of say I think it'll be this way because I, I think my urban colleagues will see it a different way and transport and governance and so forth. And, and, and a lot of these concepts, they're not brand new. I mean, we think we're articulating it with a sort of new formality to some of the jargon and new lessons learned. But many of my um, social sector colleagues, they talk about community-driven development and you know, being very participatory in their design processes. And, <laughs> and for them, they may be perhaps a bit technophobic, but until they start to get into this living lab methodology, and it resonates to them, and it's, it's actually quite familiar in many cases. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll find surprises that will sort of um, reveal, I think, new um, optimism and new, new advances for us. Hope so. Thank you very much. These three people are the... Uh, reference uh, points, I guess, and, and also our tools. So if you want to discuss more of the process or be engaged with it, you know who to talk to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.